Uh, just good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Chamber of Commerce Legal Assist webinar today. Uh, we're delighted to have HSM once again providing us with some useful information on several topics I think are obviously very important to everyone during these times. They'll be discussing debt solutions for businesses of all sizes, commercial leases, landlord and tenant issues, mortgage, personal loans, and credit card collection, and, of de and debt and enforcement. So I'd like to thank Hugh Moses and his team for providing us with another hopefully insightful uh, workshop. Just as a reminder, I'd ask everyone to put their, their microphones on mute. And if you have an, any challenges, you may want to um, uh, dis disable your video because that may improve your, your bandwidth for the, the webinar. So I'd like to thank my team at the chamber as well for helping with this. And um, I'm just gonna introduce you Moses now. So he'll say a few words before introducing the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the managing partner of HSM. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who've tuned in today. Um, if your surname is L to Z, I guess you're a little bit uh, in prison today. Uh, but uh, sorry, I meant the other way around. If uh, sorry, yeah, no, if you're A to Z, if you're L to Z, you're in prison today, and probably this forms some kind of entertainment value. But um, we did a seminar last week, and we focused on the employment and immigration issues arising out of COVID-19. Today, we're going to focus on some of the financial impact. We realize and appreciate that almost every business in the Cayman Islands right now is seeing both a drop in income, a delay in receipt of payment of bills, and of course, our expenses are not necessarily going away anytime soon. So there's a lot of financial pressure out there on every business, irrespective of its size. And what we're hoping today is to give you some insight into some possible solutions. Like business continuity plans, financial health is something that we should all be cognizant of all of the time because it does put us in a better position when things like COVID-19, Hurricane Ivan, etc., hit us somewhat unexpectedly or at least faster than we had anticipated. So today we're going to walk you through um, financial strategies for a financial health as opposed to um, physical health. We're going to talk about some debt solutions that we think will work irrespective of the size of your business. We're going to look at collecting debts and their enforcement, particularly in a COVID-19 environment. We're going to talk about some landlord and tenant issues um, because many of the businesses out there are both sometimes landlords, but majority will be tenants and have obligations to their landlords. And we're going to talk about mortgages, personal loans, and credit cards, both in terms of um, dealing with issues in terms of payment and in terms of collecting on those liabilities. Um, with that said, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Shula, who will take us forward through the presentation. Thank you, Hugh. Um, hello to everybody. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, a healthy cash flow is basically the lifeblood of, of any business, as I'm sure you all know. And um, how to avoid bad debt um, is not always um, possible, especially in the current climate. Um, but there are some steps that you can take um, in order to deter your existing customers or clients from defaulting, but also enhance your ability to be able to collect those um, both during potentially um, but also after um, these restrictions these current restrictions are lifted um, these steps are equally um, valid so um, for example no, knowing your client I'll, I'll take you through that uh, assessing risks um, with credit risk policies um, protecting your business um, comprehensive and enforceable contracts are very important. Um, equally, our debt collection policies. 
um, and the uh, current accounting and record keeping. So uh, the knowing your client, um, hopefully you all have um, an element or majority of this type of information already, um, but certainly if your um, client or customer is a company, um, obviously the full name of the company, registered office, years in business, etc. cetera. Um, these are all um, important uh, pieces of information which will help you potentially collect uh, later. Um, if it's an individual, their full name, physical address, um, as many contact deals, details as possible, um, date of birth, passport, driving license, and employment details if they have employment. Um, and carry out due diligence. So um, requesting or updating at this point any information that you don't have in terms of um, bank references, credit references, um, statement of means detailing income assets and liabilities and such like. Um, as I said, hopefully you've got uh, most of this information already, but it's certainly worth taking a, ha having a look at your existing client base. Um, this will help you in terms of um, accounts receivables at some future point. So um, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, advisable to completely suspend pursuit of all debt. Uh, collection at this stage certainly. Uh, it might seem like an obvious thing to do uh, because a lot of people are in the same boat. Um, it's not necessarily the strategy that should be implemented by any business and um, reviewing all current uh, client, clients or customers with uh, and current and contracts uh, that you have, credit agreements you have with them um, is crucial. So um, Identifying the debts that can still be pursued now um, and those which can't. So you're potentially looking at um, those clients who uh, are ordinarily in good standing. Um, they uh, have never had or have been very infrequently in any kind of delinquency in terms of credit that's been extended to them. So you need to make a careful note of the reasons for any drop in income you see or any drop in payments from customers who have, for example, um, and really look at their industry and what's happening. Um, and also uh, their, their income as a, as a household potentially, potentially or as a business. Um, and this data will assist you um, now, but also later in terms of uh, reaching some kind of agreement with them on repaying um, outstanding debts, but also which ones to potentially pursue uh, first. So looking to your credit um, policy. So if your business, for example, extends a line of credit to your customers, you may wish to consider implementing or amending any existing credit policy you have um, in order to reflect the um, business's appetite to lend in the current time. So what kind of um, changes do you want, might want to make to your own credit policy? Um, any written policy should include um, terms and conditions for supplying goods and services on credit, um, the customer qualification criteria, uh, any terms of repayment, you may wish to revisit that, um, and how uh, credit will be monitored um, and steps that need to be taken. Um, and they're, they're, that's when your collection policy will, will come into play. Or if you don't have one, um, certainly I would look at um, uh, implementing and creating one. Um, so, Careful, carefully consider the credit worthiness of the overall and the overall relationship you have with your customer um, because you're hoping that there will still be customers um, after this crisis has, um, has passed. Um, so do look at um, your credit policy um, and what potential amendments you might want to make um, either pre or post um, communications conversations with um, those you extend credit to.
So there are certain important contractual clauses. Um, it's very important to have a robust uh, contract in place. Uh, if you don't have one, potentially looking into um, that um, in order to enhance your prospects of collecting. Um, and you should definitely use this time currently to, um, to assess uh, these contracts and whether they're suitable. Um, I'm presuming majority would not um, have accounted for this kind of pandemic. Um, so certainly revisiting um, your any contracts you have in place um, is definitely worth doing. And important things from a, just from a debt protection uh, perspective later um, are specific clauses such as um, default interest clauses and um, one thing you have to be careful about um, default interest clauses are uh, they they sometimes uh, we see quite a lot where the interest is, is very high and courts are and have the power to um, withhold um, awarding if they deem any um, interest rates or default interest clauses to be penal. Um, so you have to be a bit careful about the uh, number that you put in there. Um, but it gives you the ability to reclaim interest on any amounts that are in default. And indemnity costs clauses allow you to recover um, illegal fees um, and any attempts or costs and expenses incurred in, um, in the collection process. Okay. Um, in relation to limited companies and personal guarantees, this is um, quite important. Um, so if uh, you are contracting or you have extended a credit um, agreement, you have a credit agreement with a company, um, the contractual liability is the company. And obviously in the current climate, uh, we're hoping this doesn't happen too much across the board, but um, we're, where a company um, is struck off or no longer trading, uh, no, has no assets or, for example, is wound up, you can potentially find yourself with a credit agreement um, that you can't enforce. So um, that company or that entity no longer exists, you cannot pursue them for that debt or any debt that's accumulated under that agreement. Um, I'm sure some of you already have, um, but if you don't, potentially that's something worth looking at. Um, a personal guarantee from, example, a, a director of that company. That allows you to then pursue the director of that company um, for the debt that's accumulated under that agreement. Um, and the key things to be included, um, included in a personal guarantee are um, that it be formally drafted. Um, we've seen some where people have attempted to do it themselves. Um, this can actually work against you and hinder, hinder any possibility of um, recovery, depending on what it says. So make sure it's formally drafted um, and stipulate um, that the guarantor has been given uh, the opportunity to seek legal advice or waived that right. Uh, because that's a potential avenue of challenge at some later point. Um, and that it's signed and it's witnessed as a deed, very important. Um, so personal guarantees are repayable on demand. So ensure that um, any demand that you make uh, for the recovery of any debt under that agreement is um, validly served and you can evidence that. Quite often we use um, service uh, process servers to um, effect personal service. Um, this, this is very good evidence that somebody has actually received that. If you can't evidence that, you could potentially come um, get into trouble at some later stage. So looking at uh, any debt collection policy, again, very important. You certainly should be reviewing, amending um, any collection policy in light of the current um, restrictions. So ensure that you have a good comprehensive policy in place um, and that it's well drafted and tailored to your specific business. Um, so a collection policy should really include um, 
a consistent framework for the entire company um, documenting actions and timescales to be taken. Um, and it identifies the responsibilities of certain staff members, who's responsible for what at what stage. Uh, ensure a uniform approach um, to the treatment of customers. That may, um, may change slightly in terms of uh, is you're going to be potentially giving more leeway to if you're able to. Um, um, and again, that links back to uh, reasons for um, reasons for becoming potentially a delinquent, whether they were already pre-existing, there were already problems with that particular client or customer. Um, and it prevents overdue accounts being overlooked. Um, so you have a system in place, in-house, to deal with collections. Um, and remember that the longer uh, a debt is left, the less chance you have of successfully collecting. Um, that is important. So a debt collection policy should be tailored to your business um, but should include these basic things. Um, we've put some time frames in um, which are the norm. Um, so you think of sending your invoices out um, and making sure that it provides for a specific period for it to be paid, for example, 14 days. Uh, a, a first reminder, a second reminder, a final warning, and then potentially um, we're going to uh, hand it over to the attorneys to collect. Um, so clear accounting and uh, record keeping, as I previously mentioned, complete and accurate record, um, uh, records are important. And um, you really want to ensure that um, you add a time frame for COVID. So whilst you may or may not be looking at recovering some or all of your um, debt at this point, depending on what your debt portfolio is like. Um, certainly for some point in the future, um, not too distant future, you can look back and identify which period and also it links back to know your client. So you've already looked at um, who has potentially fallen and um, found themselves in debt with your business. Um, and uh, make sure that you, um, you identify them so you can, so you can pursue uh, those people that, um, that you've chosen to or delay in pursuing. So some practical considerations include um, analysing your current, your current business uh, position and um, identify what um, functions your business really can't do without. Um, depending on your type of business, if you're able to move online, I'm sure some of you have already done that already, uh, but certainly do so if you're a business potentially who um, is able to um, deliver, um, then obviously moving these to keep the cash flow going, um, putting all these um, things in place. So implement cost saving measures. I'm sure some of you have already looked at these, um, but all but non-essential items. You need to your cash flow possible um, overheads employees um, and such like uh, are uh, do impact greatly on the cash flow of a business so avoid and mitigate the accumulation of, um, of business debts and some of those things that we've already um, spoken about will assist in, in you doing that so assess your uh, current debt portfolio um, certainly uh, if you're able to, if it's a small portfolio of debt at this point, um, you, should, you potentially could do that in-house or refer it to an attorney. Um, we are going to be um, referencing some financial assistance that the banks, government initiatives that have recently been put into place, and my colleague works there will address those at some later point in this webinar. Um, so yeah, review uh, the debt policies and business contracts both internally, so you might have your own um, internal supplier contracts. Um, you really want to be engaging with uh, your suppliers as well as your customers, um, trying to find a mutually beneficial way forward. Um, diarise, as I said, with the accounts record keeping in terms of the COVID-19 timeframe. 
um, uh, explore ways to alleviate anticipated problems with key contracts. As I said, such things like supplier contracts, um, any renewals may be coming up um, in terms of those um, contracts or uh, how you're going to extend potential further credit from any credit agreements that you've got. What kind of changes might want you might you want to make in, in that regard? So if you've got um, no uh, risk or contingency plan in place at all, um, or it's not very comprehensive, um, you really should be creating uh, one. And the contingency plans can include things like um, asking yourself as a business, uh, what kind of um, phased planning can I implement? So for example, if my business is going to be closed for uh, one month, perhaps it already has been, um, what are the financial implications of that? Um, at two months, at three months, where, where am I looking cash flow wise? Uh, what are other considerations should I be looking at to maximize um, cash flow? Um, and you need to consider exactly how long you're going to be able to maintain um, staff and business in the short, medium term. Um, that's a, certainly a very important consideration and implement um, your strategy uh, based on that and the practical considerations I've already mentioned. Um, but also consistently revisit that, uh, as I'm sure many of you are, um, because if they're not addressed uh, quickly, and certainly at this point, you don't want your business to potentially suffer um, you know, any fatal kind of harm. Um, and a comprehensive, well thought through strategy is very crucial. Um, for the future success of your business at this stage. Um, those are the overviews for um, potential debt solutions. I'm going to hand you over to uh, my colleague, Sarah, who's going to deal with um, how to collect bad debt. Thank you. Thanks, Shula. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, the purpose of the next few slides is to set out some of the legal rights and remedies that you may elect to access. Um, we're not suggesting or promoting uh, an overly aggressive um, stance in relation to debt collection. Um, it's merely to outline the remedies that you may want to access either now or in the future uh, in order to pursue your debt. Now, formal demand letters or letters before action or past due notices are probably something that you already send out if invoices are not paid on time or in accordance with the agreement that you have with your client or customer. They don't necessarily have to be prepared by an attorney. Um, you can prepare them yourself. They don't have to be overly aggressive. You can strike a tone that you feel is appropriate for your business um, and um, for the customer that you're actually uh, sending it to. But a formal demand letter really just sets out the basis of your claim um, and the basis of uh, the breach of contract or the unpaid invoice, for example. It sets out how much you're requesting that um, your customer pays it sets out the date by which you expect payment. And it can also include other amounts such as interest, um, as Shula pointed out earlier, if you've got a contractual right to interest in your, um, in your contract, then you can seek that amount as a, uh, an encouragement for um, the debtor to pay and letting them know that default interest is going to continue to accrue if the debt remains unpaid. If you have an indemnity uh, right to costs in your contract as well, your demand letter could also set out that you claim um, any legal fees or costs of collection that your business has incurred in having to pursue that debt. Uh, there is no formal requirement or what we call a, a pre-action protocol for this demand letter to be sent, but we do advise that it's a good cost-effective first step to issue in legal proceedings. It, it lets your customer know that you're serious about um, this debt and pursuing it. And it also um, is good to demonstrate to the court, if you do have to pursue legal proceedings, that you've taken some genuine attempts to try and settle the matter before getting to the door of the court. 
So as I said, it doesn't have to be prepared by an attorney, um, but it is uh, something that attorneys can prepare for you. And um, sometimes if it is on attorney letterhead, it carries a little bit more clout than if it's just on your business letterhead. We usually have the demand letters served. Now, again, there's no legal requirement that this has to be um, hand delivered to their registered office or personally served. Um, but if you feel that the communications have run dry and your customers and clients are simply not engaging with you, it's usually um, a good way of bringing the demand letter to their attention. Um, and sometimes we do use process servers for this. It's also, as Shula pointed out when she was discussing the personal guarantees, it's important to make sure that you um, are serving a demand in a correct way. So, for example, if your contract says that um, a personal guarantee is repayable on demand and that demand has to be posted to a specific address, then you need to ensure that you're complying with the contractual provisions uh, to ensure that it's deemed to be good service. Uh, an attorney can also prepare an affidavit of service for you. Again, it's not a legal requirement, but it does demonstrate um, that the demand has been validly served um, and you can bring that to the court's attention if you do have to issue legal proceedings. Sarah, it's Hugh just jumping in, not trying to throw you off uh, your, uh, <laughs> your stride. And I was just going to mention one thing that occurred to me. Um, when you were talking about debtors, uh, send sorry when you were talking about the uh, the business sending their own demand letter to their customers I should just say not to forget the possibility of offering discounts or waiver of interest or some other incentive for prompt payment so you can incentivize your customers to pay you quickly if you are already suffering from cash flow issues Obviously, you don't really want it to be out there on the street that you're in financial difficulty. But quite often, we will advise clients to say, yes, you're, you, know, you can send the letter and say you're entitled to 15% interest under the terms of your contract, but you might get a better response if you say, but of course, I'm willing to waive the interest if you pay me by the end of the week, that kind of thing. Or... You know, if you are a shop selling product, um, if you pay for the order that we've already delivered, then next time you place an order, we will top your order up by 5% free of charge, that kind of thing. So incentivizing your customers to pay at this time is a useful, practical uh, tool to have to hand. Sorry, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. And... Um... Uh, uh, just to follow on from what Hugh said, if your demand letter does set out what you're contractually entitled to, you can always pull back from that position um, and enter into the, the negotiation phrase as well, um, such as um, negotiating um, a payment arrangement. So it may be that your customers can't pay all of the invoice that you've sent to them in one go or everything that you've specified in your demand letter but you can come to some sort of an arrangement whereby they can pay in installments um, over a period of time in order to, to satisfy their obligations. This doesn't have to be formalized, but um, again, if you wanted to, um, to crystallize that arrangement, we do use um, promissory notes to do that. So promissory notes um, is uh, just a, a signed written promise to pay. It doesn't detract from your um, contractual position that you're entitled to the debt in full, but if you do want, if you didn't have those um, good contractual provisions in place to begin with, so for example, um, you didn't have the default interest provisions in place that Shula talked about, or there was no indemnity provision for cost, it, as an act of forbearance, if you're allowing your customers to pay um, by way of monthly installments, for example, you could create a promissory note, which then creates a new legally binding contract. Um, it's a cost effective alternative um, to court proceedings. You can use it to issue legal proceedings if they do breach the terms of that promissory note. Um, and it really just helps formalize the um, payment arrangement. Um, 
if, as I said before, you do find yourself um, having to go to court, it does demonstrate that at least there's been some reasonable attempts to settle the debt um, and that you had agreed to accept payments by way of instalments, which then um, the, the client defaulted on again. There are some formal requirements to a promissory note, um, which I won't go into detail on. It's something that we do cover in our um, extensive debt collection course, but it is important just to point out that there are stamp duty implications for entering into a promissory note. Um, those are set out in the stamp duty law. It's from memory, I think 25 cents for each hundred dollars that is owed, but it's capped at um, a maximum of $250. And the reason I raise that is because um, there is a provision in the stamp duty law to say that a promissory note is not invalidated simply because you haven't stamped it with, um, with the, the necessary um, uh, stamp duty, but you shouldn't be able to rely on it as evidence in court um, unless that stamp duty has been paid. Uh, and stamp duty is payable upon execution. If it's not um, paid at the time, then um, you do uh, hold yourself liable to be paying um, fees and penalties for not doing that at the time, just to be able to rely on it um, in court. So in terms of issuing legal proceedings, um, I have to say the court has acted very quickly in respect of the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, generally speaking, the courts are, are operational fully. Um, they have just modified their procedures, um, which are updated frequently on the judicial website. Um, in the most recent uh, update from the Chief Justice, which I believe was on the, the 28th of March, um, the courts set out various different modifications to their procedures on how they are going to be administratively handling matters um, and also how court hearings are taking place. Um, generally speaking, the court now accept payments online, uh, filing fees that have to be paid or um, ad valorem, which is a, a type of tax on um, uh, uh, writs that you might be issuing, um, can all be paid online. Um, important documents, affidavits, pleadings can all be filed um, electronically through the civil registry and you'll uh, get a, a sealed copy back via email. Um, and all the hearings are taking place now via video link if, if possible. Um, so generally speaking, the courts are open for, open for business um, and uh, are fully functional. If you find yourself um, having to issue a claim, we have two forums. Um, the summary court, which is the appropriate forum for claims less than 20,000. The 20,000 limit um, doesn't include your default interest if you're claiming that it's the principal sum. So if your invoice was for 10,000, then you would find yourself um, squarely in the summary court. The summary court is designed for litigants in person, generally speaking, um, and as a measure of trying to ensure that costs are proportionate to the amount of the debt and the importance of the issue, costs are fixed by the summary court on a sliding scale, depending on the level of, of the debt. So for instance, if um, you were unsuccessful in your claim, the usual rule is that the loser pays the winner's costs. Um, uh, unless there was a contractual right to cost, the, the most that you would be expected to pay in the summary court is 2000. The same is true if you're successful in uh, pursuing a claim. So if you're um, successful in pursuing your debtor, um, then the most that the court would expect them to pay back um, would be proportionate to the amount of debt that you were claiming. So that's just a, a, a flag to say that you might not get all of your costs back if you're issuing in the summary court unless you've got a contractual right to them. Um, again, proportionate to, to the level of, of the debt, there's no filing fees. Um, in fact, I think that there's a, a nominal filing fee of $25 and there's no ad valorem or, or um, which is kind of a tax payable on the, um, the claim. The Grand Court is for claims 
of over 20,000 or for certain issues which, which have to be heard by the Grand Court. Costs are not restricted there, which means if you're successful, then there should be an order that the debtor pays your costs, which um, should either be agreed or they have to go through a process known as taxation. Um, that's where you submit a bill of costs that you've incurred from instructing your attorney to pursue a matter in the Grand Court. Um, and they usually go to a taxing officer who is, assesses how reasonable those costs are. Um, filing fees are applicable in the Grand Court um, and uh, there's also an ad valorem, as I said before, which is applicable depending on the amount of your claim. So I'm just going to run through kind of a typical litigation process. Obviously, um, all claims are different. The issues could be different. So it's important to seek legal advice if you are thinking about issuing a claim yourself. But largely, um, the process between the summary court and the grand court is very similar. Um, there's just slightly different terminology and, and there are different rules. If you go to the top of the chart, um, it says plaint or writ issued. A plaint is um, a document that you would issue in the summary court. It's a, a concise summary of your claim, which in this instance would be setting out your contract, setting out how that debtor had breached the contract, um, setting out what loss you had suffered as a result, for example, your unpaid invoice, um, and then a brief summary of any other claims, such as your claims to interest or leave of cost. The exact same is true um, in the Grand Court, it's just that we refer to it as a writ of summons instead. Issuing um, a plaint or writ is the process by, um, by which you would take it to the court or, or in light of the current restrictions, you'd be emailing it to the civil registry and paying your fee online you will then get a sealed copy back. That sealed copy, which is um, stamped by the court, then needs to be served on the debtor. If your debtor is an individual, um, the current provisions are that you have to personally serve that. I'll, I'll come on to that in a second as to perhaps how those um, rules could be relaxed. It also, if your, if your debtor is a company, has to be served at the registered office of that, um, uh, of that uh, company or, or body corporate. The debtor then has 14 days in which to acknowledge the um, claim or to put in a defense, for instance, why the debt isn't owed. If no defense or acknowledgement is sent back to the court by the debtor, then we follow the process which is set out in the left-hand column um, litigate, uh, of the litigation process. So if no defense or notice of intention to, uh, notice of intention to um, contest the debt is filed, then you're able to apply for an administrative, um, uh, file an administrative application called default judgment. So this is um, judgment that you're able to enter in default of there being a defense filed. Um, it's a, an application that goes to the court, the court considers it, and um, if um, the court is satisfied that you've complied with all of the arrangements and requirements for service and bringing that to the debtor's attention, then they will issue what we call um, the default judgment. And that is your piece of paper from the court that says this debtor formally owes your business X amount plus interest um, plus your entitlement to costs. You then have to personally serve that default judgment on the debtor for it to become legally enforceable. If a defence is filed, um, it is advisable to seek legal advice um, because there are different procedures um, involved depending on the nature of the dispute. But that would follow the, the right hand column. Typically, the court would set down directions in order to timetable and manage the matter through to a contested trial. So in the summary court, that would be a final hearing whereby you would uh, bring all of the evidence that you wanted to rely to the court hearing and the magistrate would ask questions um, of each of yourself and um, the debtor to satisfy him or herself as to whether, whether that, that debt is, is owed by that person. Um, 
in the grand court it's uh, slightly more formal in terms of the procedure um, procedures to be followed but there are various things such as disclosure which is the legal process by which each party has to uh, serve upon the other any documents upon which they uh, wish to rely or which relate to the issues um, in question there could be such things as expert evidence required witness statements uh, which is witness statements of any fact um, and then you would have your contested trial nine times out of ten though if you do have a contract in place as Sheila set out earlier that has all of your contractual provisions in that has been properly signed by the debtor there is usually very little that can be said in response to the claim so we usually find ourselves that um, we're in a position to enter default judgment um, but it is important to ensure that all your documentation is in order in order to be able to follow kind of the administrative side um, on the left hand column of the litigation process um, as opposed to finding yourself in, in territory where you've got a contested claim. So the purpose of issuing legal proceedings is to get your piece of paper stamped by the court to say that that debtor owes you the money. Um, but once you've got your judgment, what happens next? Well, unfortunately, the money doesn't magically appear in your bank account. Life would be much easier if it did. Um, it means that you potentially have to select an enforcement remedy. Now, again, I'm going to outline some of these. I'm not suggesting that um, an overly aggressive stance at this time in relation to collection of debts. It's main, mainly to inform and educate as to what remedies you could potentially access if you issue legal proceedings. The first is what we call a judgment debtor examination. And um, as an attorney, it is something that we usually advise our clients to take as a first step. A judgment debtor examination is an order that is made by the court administratively and it will summon that debtor to attend court on a particular date and time and produce a statement of means setting out their assets, liabilities, uh, income. And the purpose of it is really to ascertain the financial position of that debtor. How much do they have in their bank account? Do they own a property? Um, what can they usefully afford towards this debt? What could they sell in order to satisfy the debt? Sometimes the hearings result in the debtor making an offer to pay back the judgment debt by way of monthly instalments. And if the court feels that that is reasonable in the circumstances, then um, the judgment debt could be um, uh, ordered to pay back by um, uh, periodically. The judgment debtor examination is also um, very useful because if you found that your debtor has just not engaged with you so far, they've not been picking up the phone, they haven't responded to the claim that you've issued at court, um, they really do have to attend this court hearing. There is a penal notice which is attached to orders for examination, which means that if they don't attend um, and there is no good reason for their attendance, then they could find themselves on the other end of a bench warrant issued by the magistrate or um, a grand court judge for their arrest, um, which means that they would have to attend on the next occasion so it could proceed. So it is something that um, is taken very seriously by the court, um, but it is a useful um, step to ascertain financially, is that debtor able to pay your judgment? If your debtor is an individual that is employed, for example, um, you could have the instalment order backed by what we call an attachment of earnings order. So that is an order which compels the debtor's employer to deduct um, a regular amount from their salary and pay it directly either into court um, or into uh, to an attorney or, or directly to yourself. Um, Obviously, the, the attachment of earnings order is very useful because it ensures that you're not relying on that debtor to pay those monthly instalments. You're taking it directly from the employer. And it is an order which 
which binds the employer and um, also places other obligations on them to notify the court if, for example, their employment terminated um, or if there was uh, any change in, in their salary. Um, so it is something that we, we do tend to use in order to um, get those debtors who are employed to repay by way of regular monthly instalments. And I'd say it's probably one of the enforcement remedies that, that we use the most. But of course that requires them to have a, a job and um, that's why it's really important to go through the judgment debtor examination process to find out um, exactly what the circumstances of that debtor might be in order to select your next enforcement remedy. Um, a charging order is um, available if a debtor owns a property. Now, unfortunately, it's not available if a property is jointly owned. Um, so the debtor would have to own that property as a, as a sole proprietor. But um, a charging order is basically um, a court sanctioned mortgage. So the judgment debt that you've secured would um, be used to place on um, the debtor's property like you would expect to see in a mortgage and it would rank in priority behind any other mortgage that they had. So for example, if they had their main mortgage, then your charging order would sit behind that. The purpose of a charging order is to provide you as the judgment creditor with some security. So if the debtor ever sold that property in the future, it means that perhaps their mortgage company was paid out first. And if there was any equity in the property, then it would be used to um, either satisfy full, in full or in part your judgment debt. It is also possible if you have secured your judgment debt on that person's property to enforce the right of sale um, as if you were a mortgage company. <clears throat> um, I would, obviously it's a very draconian to, to sell someone's residential property and I would urge you to seek legal advice before doing so because there is um, a particular procedure that has to be followed um, in terms of valuations um, and, and securing possession of that property in order to sell it. So um, I just highlighted that it, that it is possible, but generally speaking, charging orders are used just to provide you with some security so that you know at some point in the future, if that property is sold, um, your, your judgment debt is going to be repaid. Um, next is a garnishing order. Um, Garnishy orders are often confused uh, with an attachment of earnings order, um, but it, in fact it's a, a distinct uh, and, and separate uh, remedy. Um, it's used typically where a, a debtor is owed money by a third party, um, and uh, a garnishy order is whereby that third party is owed to repay you as the judgment creditor and cut out the middleman uh, being your debtor. It's, it's typically used if, for example, you go through your judgment debtor examination and you realize um, from their bank statements that in their savings account, they've got X amount of money and they're just refusing to pay it over. Your garnishy order could be used to direct the bank to freeze the account and pay those monies over to you. But the only way that you're going to know whether that debtor has got money in the bank is if you go through your judgment debtor examination first in order to get full disclosure of their finances. Um, as we move through the list, um, they do become uh, more draconian. So there is um, a, a writ that can be issued whereby the court bailiff seizes goods. Um, it cannot be general household items that people need to live. It can't be anything to do with a person's employment, for example, if they had tools. Um, it's only really to be reserved for um, uh, matters whereby you know that they have assets that, that um, wouldn't fall into those categories and that um, you know would be able to satisfy your judgment debt. Um, generally speaking, once the assets are seized, the court bailiff will advertise them and there is a public auction at the door of the court to sell them and the court bailiff's fees are taken um, in order uh, from, from any proceeds and the remains are, are paid, over to, um, paid over to satisfy your judgment. 
Um, and then we move on to kind of the insolvency options. So bankruptcy uh, uh, petitions can be issued um, against an individual or a winding up petition can be issued against a company. If either a bankruptcy order or a winding up order is made, then a trustee or a liquidator is usually appointed by the court in order to deal with that person's assets and um, distribute any assets among creditors. It's, it is expensive. It's not something that I'd advocate unless, um, unless the, the circumstances were right. So do you seek legal advice if you're thinking about that? It's also a very expensive process. Um, so it's probably not going to be, typical, uh, going to be suitable um, for your typical debtors or, or for small businesses to use. And then last, um, we have receivership by equitable execution. Um, receivership basically allows um, a, a receiver to be appointed and step into the shoes as if they were the debtor with a view to selling assets. We tend to re reserve it for more complex high value debt collection strategies. Um, but I do just highlight it there just because it is a remedy that is available. And last, um, I mentioned committal proceedings because we do still have a concept um, in Cayman called debtor's prison, which means that if, um, for instance, the uh, debtor was ordered to pay back the debt by way of installments and they willfully refused um, and disobeyed the court order in that respect, then um, a notice of motion to commit that debtor to prison um, could be made. Um, again, it's very draconian, um, but the court does have the power to um, fine or sentence somebody, uh, a debtor to prison for up to six weeks for non-payment of a debt. Um, it's also there to punish any other disobedience of, of court orders. Um, so I'm going to um, pass you back to my colleague Shula, who's going to set out some of the um, landlord and tenant issues. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about um, commercial leases, uh, probably given the audience, um, but um, certain points, um, quite a lot of the points could potentially also apply to residential leases also. Um, so we're really looking at um, the financial strategy, um, the way that you need to approach in light of COVID-19 restrictions and the, the real possibilities that we're facing, um, specifically in relation to leases. So um, just starting off with some basics, as I'm sure some of you are already very familiar, but perhaps others not. Um, the, so the basic uh, concept of a lease is, is, is a basic contract um, between the uh, the landlord and who gives exclusive possession uh, of that property to another person being the tenant um, in exchange for periodic payments of rent essentially. And so it's usually fixed term for a number of years um, and it's there as the lease is there to protect both parties so the landlord and the tenant both have um, rights and obligations uh, under, under that contract. The landlord is basically guaranteed rent for the period of the fixed term and the tenant can occupy um, as long as those terms are maintained um, at their end. Um, so there are the hallmarks of a lease are exclusive occupation um, of, of the property, um, payment of a rent for a term. So, um, yeah, commercial leases, you've got um, tenancy agreements or leases. I'm going to be looking at statutory contractual clauses, um, practical considerations um, and a breach of any tenancy, forfeiture and other remedies. So most of you, uh, no doubt, will probably have a written lease, but there can be uh, verbal leases. Uh, so uh, what happens in that situation, if, if that is the case? I'm going to assume that most of you um, deal with written leases, but I'll just cover this very quickly. So um, in terms of any um, verbal lease, and there's no written contract, 
um, and the tenant has exclusive occupation and pays a rent, um, they are deemed under the registered land law section 45.1 um, of being a periodic tenant. So that periodic tenancy um, can be for a period uh, and it's determinable usually uh, by when the rent is paid. So um, either party on notice of not, not less than the period of the tenancy. So um, I, if the rent is payable uh, monthly, then the term will be uh, rolling monthly. Um, and the tenancy can be terminated with one month's notice. So um, key clauses. So uh, the law provides for, I'm going to read it, um, save as otherwise expressly provided in the lease, um, there shall be certain clauses implied which bind the party. And um, so section uh, 52 of the registered land law outlines the landlord's obligations. Um, and these are basically implied into a lease unless the lease itself expressly provides for something else. Um, you'll see the main ones I'd probably highlight being the landlord's obligations to provide peaceful enjoyment of the property. Um, yeah, the, that's the main one, really. Um, the others I've just listed there. Um, so the landlord's obligation as well, um, under section 54 of the registered land law, it defines the meaning of repair and um, any breach of an implied uh, obligation can give rise to a claim in damages against the landlord uh, for essentially loss of enjoyment. Um, of that property. So um, here these are the, so under section 53 of the registered land law, um, these are the tenants obligations. Um, the main ones really being uh, to pay your rent in full and on time and to pay any rates or taxes or other, other outgoings, utilities for example. So um, when ending the lease, which is probably uh, something that most of you have some kind of interest in at some point at the moment, um, there are uh, various ways that that can happen. If I just run through uh, those that are currently on the screen. So you have uh, the effl effluxion of time, which is basically the fixed term period of your uh, lease naturally comes to an end and the tenant in theory vacates. Um, there's a break date, for example, where the landlord or the tenant exercise uh, their right to break by serving some kind of notice, depending on what's provided for under the lease itself. Um, surrender by deed, this is where both parties agree for the tenant to vacate early. Um, and sometimes an exchange um, is some kind of payment of a pre premium. Um, and both parties should sign a deed of surrender um, consenting to the release of their respective obligations uh, that are owed under that lease. Um, so, and then you have surrender by operation of law. Um, this will uh, be deemed to have occurred in the following situations. So firstly, where the landlord creates a new lease um, of the same premises to the existing tenant. Um, so it's effectively a new lease. Um, two, where the tenant gives up possession of the premises to the landlord and the possession is accepted um, by the landlord. So, for example, the tenant gives keys, removes all of his belongings, possessions, and the landlord accepts um, the keys. Um, and thirdly, the tenant gives up possession. 
of the premises um, to the landlord and the landlord grants uh, a new lease to a third party with the tenant's consent. So that's a situation where you have a landlord and tenant lease and you're potentially, um, potentially subleasing or by agreement of both parties to the existing lease, you have, you're putting a new person in, in, in the property. And note that um, the tenant could be liable uh, for the rent up until the date of the new lease. You can so the tenant vacates, hands back the keys, but the landlord does not accept that surrender. And in this case, the tenant is still liable uh, for the rent for the remainder of the fixed term, however long that is. And the landlord can, in theory, apply to court um, to recover any unpaid rents. <clears throat> and forfeiture, um, this is where the landlord um, exercises a right to terminate the lease and re-enter the property uh, where the tenant fails to pay, for example, the rent um, or breaches um, some other obligation and does not remedy it. Those are the main uh, normal ways of ending a lease. I'm also going to just look at, um, in light of COVID, uh, the force majeure clause. Uh, maybe, uh, again, I would advise you to either look at your leases or have an, a lawyer look at them um, to see exactly um, what provisions and clauses are, are in. So force uh, majeure clause. Um, so the basis of any, any relationship, as I've previously outlined, between a landlord and tenant is a contractual one. So um, and a, a, a clause in the contract, a force majeure clause, um, if it's contained in the uh, lease, could, in the light of COVID and the government imposed restrictions, it could be argued that that is an intervening um, event. Uh, which is basically beyond the control of all parties and potentially argued that this frustrates um, the lease, bringing it to an end. Um, and the effect of frustration is to release both parties from performance of that contract. Um, so a commercial lease um, would likely include some kind of force majeure provision. So uh, again, I would urge you to have a look at um, the provisions that you have in your clause uh, in your leases um, in order to uh, because depending on the wording of any kind of clause like that um, it could potentially allocate risk between the parties it could um, not do that so you really need to have a look at um, that type of clause in a bit more detail as it may be a way of, um, of ending of ending the lease. If there's no clause, uh, there is a potential uh, for, um, for an equitable claim under the doctrines of frustration and impossibility. I don't, I don't intend to go into those um, in too much detail. It's a fairly complex area, but certainly an area that should be explored uh, if the need arise and certainly should be looked at in terms of your, uh, any leases that you have. Um, so, yeah, generally the doctrine of frustration um, of contract applies to leases, but the is not often applied. It very much depends on uh, your particular circumstances as to whether the courts would um, allow you to um, use this, um, this clause to end any kind of contract. It can be argued, obviously, from both sides. Um, and there's a recent case, Canary Wharf um, and the European Medicines Agency, Zach decision in 2019 in the UK. And the frustration doctrine um, was argued, um, but failed in this kind of context, so a lease kind of context. Um, but there were specific, obviously, facts in relation to, to that particular case. Um, but it is, um, uh, it is an arguable point, um, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it may or may not frustrate the lease, uh, very much depends on the situation and the, um, 
the specific facts of any particular case. So I would definitely urge um, advice in relation to that. So possible pre-enforcement um, considerations in light of COVID. Um, you really want to be engaging with each other. It's, uh, landlords and tenants should, should really initially evaluate their own situation first, perhaps before engaging. Perhaps some of you have already done that. I'm sure some of you have. Um, or had um, you know, inquiries made by tenants um, who are running a business out of that uh, property. How, you know, what, what can I do? My business is closed. Can we reach some agreement being the immediate questions that spring to mind? Um, so um, the government has imposed these restrictions, obviously, as you know, and businesses um, need to look initially to themselves. So in terms of landlords, I would suggest discussion with lender. Um, it's pretty essential um, in, if you have a mortgage. Whilst they've made, and I know Sarah's going to come and talk about um, what, uh, what measures have been put in place by financial institutions in regards to mortgages, um, you as a business, what are the current terms of your mortgage? Um, have you been in contact with your bank? Um, are, you need to have that certainly if you haven't done that already. Um, how flexible can you afford to be? Uh, and what I mean by that is in terms of any potential negotiation you might have to enter into with a tenant who's a business as well. Um, from a tenant's point of view, not dissimilar to landlord, uh, it wouldn't be mortgage, obviously, in relation to um, communications with banks, but certainly who has uh, provided some kind of business loan. Um, if the business has a business loan, um, you need discussions again with your bank uh, and see what kind of agreement you can come to with them, if any. Um, and how, how flexible from, from the tenant's point of view, how flexible can you be? Um, and that very much depends on your conversation with the bank. And then uh, you come together. So I'd highly recommend at this point a collaborative approach. Um, so uh, landlords and tenants really should discuss um, the lease and, and try to collaborate. It's mutually beneficial to do that. Uh, I'm sure you're all probably um, thinking that way anyway. Um, you could look potentially at renegotiation um, of the lease terms um, or incorporation of uh, a period which specifically covers um, what you want or what you uh, are looking to achieve in terms of any kind of moratorium or suspension of rent or part thereof, etc., um, you are very free to be able to do that um, in order to try and work towards a point where uh, you know you don't lose your tenant. Otherwise, you're not getting any rent. And you still have a mortgage to pay potentially at some point. Um, so it really is mutually beneficial to look at things like rent, any penalties. Do you want to waive any of those? Uh, interest. Um, so you want to look at uh, amounts potentially, but also period of time uh, and what you can reach um, in relation to those obligations that currently still exist under under any lease that you have. Um, and whilst it's inevitable that there's going to be some kind of there is going to be a contraction, some businesses uh, may not be able to survive depending on how long this carries on for. Um, but do communicate with each other. It, it is a beneficial. Um, just saying, well, they're bound on uh, the lease to, um, I'm not going to do anything else about that. Can be a stance that you take. Um, it might potentially backfire um, if that business, if you were to work with them, could survive if you do uh, collaborate. So um, in terms of enforcement, um, yeah, the, so there should be, if you, so you've tried the collaborative approach, you've looked at your own situation, um, you've tried communicating between yourselves and you just can't reach any um, common ground. The landlord could look at um, enforcement. I. I think it's probably highly like unlikely that 
um, landlords may want to choose this route at this particular point, but it, 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 it comes into play later. So uh, the landlord's right to forfeiture, uh, which uh, is under section 55.1 of the registered land law, and provides that uh, a landlord has the right to forfeit the lease um, if the lessee, the tenant, uh, commits any breach of um, the agreement, um, is found to be bankrupt, or the company goes into liquidation. Um, the landlord must serve, is obliged to serve, the Section 56 Registered Landlaw Notice, giving the tenant reasonable notice to remedy the breach. You serve the notice, um, you give them a reasonable period. The registered land law is silent on what is reasonable notice. Look to your lease. What have you provided for in your lease? Um, if it's not provided for, which would be unlikely, but possible, uh, then what would you say is a reasonable period? Um, um, so this notice is served, giving the tenant the opportunity to remedy the breach. Uh, so if the tenant um, or any other occupant remains in possession, so they don't remedy the beach, um, you must ensure as well, sorry, in the section 56 notice that um, the breach that you're having the notice in relation to, so for example, non-payment of rent is included. Um, what constitutes rent, you need to look at your lease. Some, some leases uh, incorporate um, rent and include that which includes utilities or CAM, et cetera. Um, some of them don't. So if you don't claim in, in detail in your section 56 notice, rent, failure to pay rent, uh, but also other, uh, for example, non-payment of utilities, if it's not deemed to be rent according to your own lease, then um, you, you're going to struggle later to, to enforce in relation to that aspect. Uh, so when it comes to possession, for example, the tenant has not remedied anything, um, the, but the tenant remains in possession after the service of that section 56 notice, um, then the court, a court application would have to be made, basically compelling the occupants or the tenant, um, in this case, to deliver up vacant possession. Um, that's detailed under section 55.2 of the registered land law. There are defences that can be uh, used by uh, tenants. It can be, uh, for example, waiver. It's a very common um, defence, actually, uh, where you've um, accepted rent after either you've served notice or after the so, um, if you accept a rent after the breach, uh, that's it, that potentially could uh, deem to be, be deemed to be a waiver. Um, and also, in relation to any court application for possession, um, a tenant could claim relief. Really um, so, if they're able to remedy the breach um, of contract by paying any outstanding sums, that's a potential way to get relief from forfeiture. Um, a remedy is a quite a draconian remedy, which is found in the uh, landlord and tenant law. Um, if rent is unpaid, you, as the landlord, potentially could uh, seek uh, to collect via uh, the court. Uh, Sarah has previously outlined some procedures in relation to that. You could collect cattles, uh, basically birds or uh, etc that um, you as the landlord could seize and sell and the money is used to then pay any uh, rent that's um, owed. Okay, I'm going to hand you back to Sarah at this point, um, who's going to do, um, talk about mortgages um, and, and other things. Sarah? Thanks, George. Thanks, George. So the last few slides that I'm going to run through are um, 
assistance that has been offered by the banks and uh, some assistance that has been offered by the governments to small and micro businesses, um, which I'll run through. But I know that uh, many businesses and in fact as individuals, we're all looking at ways that we can cut our expenses um, or our, our operational costs and overheads. And the many banks and building societies on Ireland at the moment um, are offering uh, some relief for accounts that are in current good standing. Uh, unfortunately, if your business account or personal account is, is currently in default, then these may not be available. Um, but most banks and building societies, um, you know, the, the prime rates have been lowered. Um, they've lowered the rates on uh, lending, uh, personal loans, business loans and mortgage rates. And some of the banks and building societies are also offering um, a three month moratorium period. Depending on the bank or the building society um, will depend on how they deal with those missed payments. So effectively, the banks and building societies are allowing you not to make your mortgage payments or not to make your business loan payments um, for a period of three months. However, you do need to check with your individual bank um, as to what happens with those unpaid um, uh, unpaid installments of, of principal and accrued in interest. Some banks and building societies are um, what we call recapitalizing those payments, which means that it gets added to your balance. And you may find that at the end of your three month moratorium period, your monthly installment has increased slightly because you still have to pay the same amount over the remaining term of your loan or your mortgage. Um, some banks are extending the term of your mortgage um, by way of a, a formal variation to the, the terms of your contract. Um, it is important to check with your bank and building society exactly what um, financial consequences there will be to your loan. Um, because, as I said, either your monthly instalment may increase or the overall amount that you have to repay. Um, uh, may increase. Um, so it is important to, to check exactly how that's going to impact um, impact your, your position. Uh, other things have been offered in terms of credit cards. So um, some banks are allowing there to be um, a, a two month deferral of payments and they're waiving any late fees that may have accrued for that period. Certain business loans um, may not have to pay interest, similar to the moratorium period that I've just outlined, uh, without there being any penalties. Um, the emphasis here is speak to your bank, have a candid and frank um, conversation, um, find out the information as to, to how it's going to affect your loan overall. Sometimes when there's a wave coming, the natural reaction is to swim fast, um, but it, it may just may be better to go with the wave sometimes. So do check exactly what this means in terms of your financial obligations um, to the bank. Um, the Cayman Islands government is uh, providing some um, assistance to individuals, um, mainly to help uh, the vulnerable. Uh, Cabinet has just approved a three million um, $3 million to assist Caymanians um, who are vulnerable, elderly or disabled. This is in addition to um, assistance that may have already been provided. Um, the cabinet has also approved emergency funding for non Caymanians, um, for those who perhaps have lost their job um, are here currently as tourists waiting to go home um, with food vouchers. So work permit holders with no savings or income may apply for $150 of food vouchers from the 1st of April, just for two weeks until either the airports open um, or they can restart their employment. There has also been some word from the government that they are encouraging residential landlords to be flexible using the security deposits as in lieu of rent if, if uh, necessary. Um, as Sheila said, a collaborative approach with landlords, especially if um, that particular landlord has got a three month moratorium break on their mortgage payments, um, working with your landlord to see if you can also benefit from that break and negotiate with them 
Um, but there's no real law or regulation. This is just encouraging landlords um, to be sensible and um, not to uh, take advantage in a situation like this. Um, cabinets also authorised stimulus packages um, and financial and non-financial support for micro and small businesses, um, which I'll come on to in the next slide. So we know from kind of the press briefings that, that happen every day that um, the Honourable Premier has mentioned um, on numerous occasions that there's going to be discussions ongoing in terms of what financial support um, that there could be for, for bus the business sector um, and the economy generally. Um, but on the 6th of April, so just a couple of days ago, uh, Minister Hugh outlined some of the relief uh, measures that have been implemented by the Cayman Islands Centre for Business Development, um, including the fast track opening uh, uh, of that centre. Um, so the, the business centre um, is going to pro be providing um, financial and technical support to micro businesses um, and small businesses. So these um, businesses are as defined by the trade and business in license, uh, so trade and business, sorry, and license in law. Um, micro businesses have to be less than five employees and have a gross revenue of less than 250,000. Small businesses are defined as being those who employ a maximum of 12 employees and have a gross revenue of up to um, 750,000. Um, some of the details um, um, of the programmes I've set out in the slides. The first one is um, a low interest loan. So up to 200, sorry, up to 20,000 for micro businesses or up to 50,000 for small businesses. Uh, which are facilitated through the Cayman Islands Development Bank. The purpose of it is to assist with cash flow. So if you need a cash injection to get you through the next few months, um, a low interest loan may be available to, to your business if you meet the requirements. Um, it's repayable over a term of five years. Uh, the interest rate is 1% for the first year, but uh, is subject to change. And it's anticipated that there would be a six month deferral of payment. So you wouldn't make any payments for the first six months whilst your business um, got back onto its feet. There are certain requirements um, that have to be met in order to um, apply for this. And that is um, attending some of the technical and training sessions that uh, the business centre are going to be putting on. So the technical assistance, this provides a business with access to qualified accountants and other professionals um, for up to a period of a year to assist with things such as financial planning, document preparation, um, business and strategic plans, any HR issues that you may be having to guide your business through this COVID-19 pandemic and the aftermath. There's also going to be some um, specific training um, packages that are put on and it's a requirement that you have to attend at least one of these in order to access the loan that I just mentioned and um, also uh, the grants which I'll mention uh, below. So participation in that is required in order to access the funding and again the purpose is to get your business back on its feet and navigate the world post COVID-19, um, which is going to be a struggle for, for many small businesses. And I think from reading Minister Hughes' um, uh, outline of, of the, the various support packages that have been offered, the purpose is just to help small businesses get back onto their feet, um, particularly the tourism industry. So um, if this applies, then um, I think small and micro businesses are being encouraged to contact um, the, the business centre to see what they can do. Last, um, there's a grant programme. Um, so if your business um, has been established for 12 months prior to March 2020 um, and you're able to evidence that financially either you've seen an increase 
in receivables, the, the amounts that you're owed, or a decrease in your sales um, and your income due to the COVID-19, then you may be eligible to um, receive $1,000 per month for a period of up to three months. Um, I put the details there um, of where you can um, make your inquiries to the Cayman Islands um, Center for Business. Um, so I would urge you to, to go and see what um, potential support packages are out there for your, for your businesses if you meet the, the requirements of a small and micro business. Last, it wasn't possible to cram everything into this session. There are also other considerations um, that you may want to think about in terms of your business. You know, do you have uh, insurance for business continuity? Uh, many businesses don't, particularly small businesses. That's insurance that would step in in a situation like this and pay your, your you know, maintain your operating costs. There's other things that you may want to consider and seek legal advice with which HSM um, can help. Insolvency um, is something that we don't want to think about, but it's um, it, unfortunately a melancholy consequence of, of this COVID-19 pandemic that some businesses won't survive, how that might affect you um, as a director. You could be having employment related issues with um, staff that your business employs and having to do temporary layoffs or redundancies. Um, that's a talk that um, Hugh Moses and the employment team gave um, recently to the Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, and other practical considerations, contracts with third parties, the use of electronic signatures, um, just some of the considerations that you might want to reach out and, and get specific advice on. So I think I um, will pass it back to Will now and um, we can make this interactive. If anybody has any questions, then um, we can make use of that time to do that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you, you uh, actually delivering these presentations. Um, as we've been saying on the chats, if anybody has a question, I know um, a couple of questions have come forward. So if you could, if you could um, either raise your hand so I can open your mic, if you have any burning question you'd like to ask any of the HM, uh, HSM um, attorneys who are present with us. There was one that uh, Allison said here, can a client seek a reduction in contracted professional fees due to diminished contracted services due to COVID and the CIG shelter in place order? Um, Sorry. Uh, Will, I'll send the answer on that one right now. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, I see there's another message here. Uh, what is the health insurance liability after termination? Can somebody answer that? Hugh, would, would that be uh, more of an employment related matter for, for you? Yes, indeed, but uh, I'll answer it very briefly. Uh, broadly speaking, on the termination of employment, the health insurance law requires the employer um, oh, just one second. Yeah, generally speaking on the termination of employment or the employer is liable to keep the employee insured under the health insurance provisions uh, contract that existed for a period of up to three months following the first of the month after termination. Now, the requirement to do that is on the employer, but the requirement to pay the premium, 100% of the premium, is on the employee. Now, many practical problems arise when you are not able, as it were, to deduct the forthcoming three months premium from the termination uh, payment you are making to the employee. If you can, because you're, you should do so in our opinion, um, and you should make it clear that if the employee either leaves the island or becomes insured with another employer, they should 
notify you so that you can then terminate that health insurance and refund to them part of the premium that you have deducted but will not be using uh, as a consequence of them now becoming insured. Some employers are not paying, the, uh, are not continuing the health insurance for three months. The risk of not doing so is very substantial because if that employee falls ill and does not have the health insurance, you as the employer can be liable directly for their full medical bills. So even if you cannot recruit the health insurance premium, our strong advice is nevertheless to continue the insurance for three months until you either know the person has left the jurisdiction or got employment elsewhere where they're insured. So the person asked, uh, or somebody else asked, where in the law can this be found? It's in the health insurance law. It's not in the labor law. I can't quote you the exact section at the moment. Right. And then the next question is, are there any considerations being looked at with regards to employees that are still under contracts but not working? If an employee is still under an ongoing existing contract of employment, uh, as an employer, you do have the option of laying them off on unpaid leave for 29 days under Section 42 of the Labor Law. Otherwise, as far as we are aware, government has not yet introduced anything specifically that would mean that you do not have to pay them their salary. But you have a way of not paying them their salary for up to 29 days. But if you do not recall them in the sense of paying them again at the end of the 29 days, you're then liable to pay severance pay as if you had made them redundant. We are strongly urging government that they extend that 29 day period set out in the labor law to a minimum of three months. In the, if you're in the construction or agricultural sectors, you can lay off for up to six months without pay. But in all other sectors, you can only lay off for up to 30 days. Hence the reference to laying off for 29 days unpaid because on day 30, they resume their normal employment and, and the arrangements that you have with them in respect of that normal employment. Oh, it looks like you guys have answered most of the questions. I don't see too many people putting anything into the chat or raising their hands to, to ask a question. So um, I, I wasn't okay. sure whether my reply to Stuart actually has got posted. I'm having some difficulty posting the reply, but I will reply to Stuart on email. <laughs> All else failing. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I, no, there's one. Here we go. Okay. What is the likelihood of government extending the three months? the period for laying somebody off without pay. Um, I very much hope they do. Likelihood, I, I think when the government starts to spend, well, when they say starts to, that's unfair. When the government has an opportunity to address the economic um, situation and it realizes that it's far better for people to remain employed with their health insurance being paid than be made redundant, then I'm very much hoping that before we get to 30 days on the 25th of March, that they will change this provision. But the government has a serious practical problem in that it has to call a session of the LA in it to be able to make any legislative changes. And I know there are several legislative changes being actively considered but they have to figure out the practicality of how to hold a session of the LA while social distancing or potentially doing it by Zoom, and that has other legal issues attached to it. So I know they're trying hard, um, and hopefully they will be able to uh, come up with a solution soon. The next question is, can a client seek a reduction in contracted professional fees due to, to diminished contracted services? Yeah, that was Stuart's question. Uh, yeah. I've actually typed quite a long answer to that. Um, but um, let me, let me uh, basically this comes down to what was being talked about previously. 
is going to depend on the actual contract itself. You're going to have to look to see if the contract that the service provider has contains a force mayor provision, which could mean that the client doesn't have to pay. Equally, if it's no clause, it could be a frustrated contract. Equally, if it's a fixed fee contract to, for example, manage a strata, then it may well be the strata still liable to go on paying that fixed fee, notwithstanding the fact that the strata management company isn't dealing with the pool maintenance, isn't dealing with the gardening, because all those contracted services that it would normally be managing are on stay-at-home orders. But it's still going to be performing a substantial part, potentially, of its other duties. So it all, it's all gonna come down to questions of fact of what the actual contract says. The practical advice may well be to try to agree something with your customer to avoid any form of legal dispute. The next question is, can an employer be requested to provide a letter of layoff so this can be provided to the landlord in case of not able to pay rent? Well, I would take the view that any, any employer who was laying off staff and invoking section 42 should do so in writing because if they do not do so and they are not invoking section 42, they could be liable for the criminal offense of not paying wages, leaving aside possible debt claims in respect of those wages. So it's in the employer's interest to provide such a letter saying, I have laid off Sarah Allison for 29 days on no pay, dear landlord. Um, but again, many employers obviously have many more things on their minds than worrying about producing these letters and they may not be willing or able to do so for a variety of reasons. I mean, the only thing one can do from a practical point of view is if the employer is not prepared to provide the letter, then we would assume that there's a text message, a WhatsApp, uh, something, an email maybe, that records the laying off of the employee and just provide that to the landlord or just ask the landlord to reach out directly to the employer. But is it a legal requirement to produce that letter? No. But it would be helpful. But of course it would be helpful and I would say any responsible employer who's physically able to produce that letter should do so. I mean, we're all in this to get. We're all in this together. It's a crisis, and employers need to step up and help their employees as far as they can. Absolutely. So, what if during the the next question here is, um, what if during the shelter and home the work permit expires for the employee? What is the employer's responsibility as it relates to insurance? I'm not sure I got the last bit of that, or really how that ties in, but. I if the contractual employment relationship is continuing, the obligation to pay health insurance continues. Um, if a work permit expires, then um, WAC have put out statements to the effect that the employee can continue to work even though the work permit has expired, um, provided they take all available and necessary and reasonable steps to try to renew it. So. At this point in time, um, emails to walk saying my purpose, well, the employer would have to be saying this, not the employee, um, would have to be saying to walk the permit for uh, my lawyer, Sarah Allison, sorry, Sarah, I keep picking on you, um, mm -hmm. has expired. I very much want to renew it. Um, I'm, I'm perhaps saying, you know, I have completed the necessary forms. I've written the check and here's a picture of it. Uh, and I understand that she can now continue to work until such time as the COVID or the stay at home order is lifted. And when that happens, you know, I'm going to do my best to regularize the position with immigration. So we strongly recommend reaching out to WAC. We do know that they are actively trying to put in place provisions whereby people can pay immigration related fees electronically to them. At this moment in time right now, as far as I'm aware, those arrangements are not yet finalized. 
Um, so where we are working on renewing work permits and so forth, we're basically telling our employers to put the money in our trust account and then we give an attorney's undertaking to immigration that we're holding the money and we will release it to immigration um, as soon as they provide us with the relevant account to send the money to, which makes it even stronger. It's not like the checks in the post or I might write out a check in due course. It's actually the money is in our trust account. Next question says, but I guess there's a follow up, but what if the company is not in the position to renew the permit? What then? Well, then uh, it's basically a redundancy. Now, it's going to depend largely on the actual contract of employment because some contracts of employment are for fixed terms that run at the same time as the work permit. In those circumstances, the contract of employment simply ends and the employee uh, in normal circumstances would then be going to immigration and asking for time effectively, uh, a visitor stamp to stay on the island pending uh, making arrangements for their departure, you know, selling their car, uh, et cetera, that kind of thing. Um, again, at the moment, if that happens to somebody and their contract's terminated, and they're under one of these co-terminus with a work permit and they're told it's not being renewed, all they can do, because obviously there are no planes, um, is to again reach out to walk and just say, um, my employment has ended, which of course there's also a legal obligation on the employer to do anyway, um, and say, um, you know, I, 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 and I intend to regularize my position as soon as possible. But obviously, immigration aren't stamping passports at the moment. So the next question is, if the employer is paying the employee's full salary during the stay at home, yeah. can the employer agree with the employee to apply his or her vacation during this period? Yes. By agreement, yes. All right. Well, it seems like we've answered uh, most yeah. of the chat questions. So I just I, like I, I'd strongly urge any employer who's got any employment and immigration related questions to get a drink, sit down and listen uh, to on the Chamber website, the two hour presentation we did on just this subject last week. Because, you know, everything you probably want to know is buried somewhere in that two hour presentation. Absolutely. And so that's everybody knows who's on the call. Uh, we are actually organizing weekly webinars on different subjects. So right now we're in touch with the Cayman Islands Business Development Center. And the reality is we're gonna try to have a presentation by them, kind of going into the details about the package that they've just uh, put out there for us. I have received um, requests for what the businesses that fall outside of that package and what actions will be taken to help them. So I can tell you, and I can assure you that the Chamber Council met, or the Executive Committee met yesterday, and we're in the process of putting some proposals together to share with the government. We'll also be sending out a survey to our members, as well as the wider business community, to kind of give, ask you to give us a sense of the impact of COVID, the COVID-19 crisis on your business. And then, It'll be very important for you guys to fill that information out for us so we can kind of share the gravity of the seriousness of this matter with the government so that we can put really good recommendations forward as to how to address us over the next six to nine months. And then finally, those businesses that are in a situation where you have expatriate or guest workers who have been laid off and unfortunately may not have a chance to come back to the employment, uh, you can actually submit some of those um, uh, individuals or tell, give us an idea at the chamber how many employees you're actually looking to uh, repatriate. Um, if we don't address this matter in the next three to six months, we're gonna have a humanitarian crisis on our hands where there'll be a lot of people who will not have the ability to look after themselves. I know both the private sector and government's working to ensure that over the next two to three months, but if this wears on uh, for several months, then we're gonna have to make sure that um, the people who cannot look after themselves and have a chance to return home 
can have that ability. So please uh, share that information with us. Yes, well, I, th I think that's very important because uh, as somebody who's advising employers on a very regular basis every single day, uh, we are well aware of very large numbers of expatriates uh, being laid off and or being made redundant across all sectors um, at the moment. Now, the governor has mentioned the possibility of Cayman Airways related evacuation flights uh, on the short hops to places like Jamaica and Honduras, um, Cuba, etc. He's also made the point that it would be possible potentially to have those same evac flights going to the UK and then onward arrangements being made to farther jurisdictions such as the Philippines. Now, as with any arrangement of this kind, knowing that there is a demand, an identifiable demand for those flights is critical in both the planning and the urgency of making those arrangements. So I think it's very important that yeah, if you are a Honduran and who's just been made redundant, you get your name out there as you know, if of somebody who wants to return to Honduras, because the economic question of who pays for that flight is still out there to be determined. But if you don't put your name forward and there isn't enough people to fill a plane, there's no plane going to Honduras. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hugh and your team. Uh, thank you, Alison, um, and thank you. Um, uh, Shula, I appreciate all your expertise. And again, we'll be organizing more legal assist programs, hopefully in partnership with HSM and, and other law firms. So please remain posted. Uh, you know, we'll remain in contact. If you want to sign up to our newsletter, we have a daily watch that we send out not only to our members, but the business community generally. So please uh, sign up. You can go to the Chamber website at caymanchamber.ky and uh, sign up. And hopefully everyone has a great day. And thank you for joining us for this Legal Assist program.